<clears throat> this is Biotech Lecture Chapter 12 on Biotechnology and Biodiversity. Uh, this is the lecture that was supposed to take place on Friday the 31st of March. However, um, it, it will be available for viewing on Tuesday uh, the 4th of April. The objectives of this chapter are to define uh, biodiversity, uh, to talk about uh, the definition of species and what natural selection is among species, uh, to discuss the different endangered species and discuss how species become endangered, and discuss ways that biodiversity may be maintained in the face of biotechnology. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about mining biodiversity. Now, biodiversity, as defined, is the total number of species present on Earth at any given point in time. It's currently estimated to be about 5 million. I've seen as some estimates as high as 15 million, uh, and uh, realizing that the majority of the 5 million to 15 million species that you see are microbial in origin. Uh, about 2 million species have been identified to date, and only about 43,000 are vertebrates. So there's, in, in terms of higher species, there are not very many, and only about 4,000 species are mammals. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of different species of plants, over a quarter of a million species of plants, so that accounts for a large portion of the biodiversity. And there are many species of in insects, almost three quarters of a million. Okay. So what is a species? A species is an organism that is reproductively isolated from other groups in nature. So in other words, uh, you can only reproduce within a species. So if uh, members of two of uh, members of the same species mate, then that is reproductively um, Productive. It results in uh, babies, baby animals, baby insects, uh, baby humans, baby plants. Uh, however, when two species, uh, when two individuals from two different species mate, then that does not uh, result in reproductivity. Um, we know that. Um, there are certain hybrids that occur in nature, however, those hybrids are generally sterile. Uh, when you mate a uh, donkey with a horse, you get a mule. Um, so the f first generation is reproductive, but mules are generally sterile, and so uh, they do not comprise a separate species because they are not fit. They do not have genetic fitness, they cannot pass on that species. Okay. So, in other words, gene flow can only occur within the members of the same species. So, genetic information can only be shared within that species, and by definition, that if that species goes extinct, then that genetic flow, or that amount of genetic information is lost forever. Okay. Um, now, where hybrids are formed, um, and also for asexual reproduction, which is most uh, prokaryotes and a lot of lower eukaryotes uh, reproduce asexually, uh, it's difficult to apply this particular criterion. Uh, there is some level of species fluidity, especially if you look at the fossil record. Um, that is also subject to debate, but it is difficult to um, nail down a species per se and then watch the natural selection or watch the evolution of that particular species uh, become something else. Okay. But basically each species is a repository of genetic information. Like I said, that genetic information is lost upon extinction. Natural selection. Now, all organisms that uh, are theoretically capable of producing uh, offspring that will survive. However, not all individuals in a species are equally likely to survive. 
genetic differences uh, within the species uh, will create um, those organisms that are, gonna, are more likely to survive under a given set of environmental conditions and those that are less likely to survive under a given set of environmental conditions. So the theory of natural selection is those individuals that are better adapted to a given environment will have a greater probability of surviving and reproducing. And Darwin and Wallace um, held that this mechanism produces gradual changes within populations and that it could also uh, result in new species. Um, some of this has been modified um, by what's called punctated equilibrium, where drastic changes in species are seen, especially uh, in uh, cataclysmic events in the environment. Uh, so it's a little bit, the theory of evolution has evolved, uh, and uh, knowing what we know now about uh, what's called punctated equilibrium. Uh, and uh, species genetic fitness is the ability to produce more surviving offspring to basically successfully pass genes from one generation to the next generation. And the more biodiversity you have in a given species, the more genetic diversity that you have, the higher the level of genetic fitness because you'll have um, at least some coverage uh, given a, a difference in environmental conditions that will survive that difference. Now, natural selection has a number of practical applications, and it predicts that if uh, you have a population and it's exposed to a given toxin, um, and not all the population is killed by that toxin, then resistance to the toxin will evolve. In other words, those species or those members of the species that survive that toxin will have some type of genetic resistance to that particular toxin. Okay. And uh, in it, it sort of chases its tail in a way. Uh, in nature, uh, those insects that are herbivores um, will evolve so they can break down natural plant toxins but then the plants will evolve to produce new toxins and in turn the insects evolve. So there's this sort of tension between the insects, uh, the predator, and the plant, the prey, uh, and their ability to outwit each other through uh, evolution. Uh, and any, any type of predator and prey, you, you see a, a, sort of a similar co-evolution. It's not necessarily uh, that the prey becomes toxic. The prey just may become better at evading the predator. Now, within species, you also have what's called subspecies. And subspecies um, uh, are different populations within a species. And a species can consist of many different populations. Okay? And when those differences within the species are noticeable and consistent, that should say consistent, not consist, um, then scientists can designate subspecies. Uh, we do this all the time in microbiology because there are certain subspecies of bacteria that are uh, genetically very similar. Uh, however, um, they uh, have distinct differences. Uh, for example, some subspecies of E. coli can make you very sick, where other species, subspecies of E. coli are rather benign. And members of the subspecies are capable of interbreeding with other subspecies. They're still, uh, you know, if you look at the definition of species, then, um, then sexual uh, contact should be uh, productive and lead to reproduction. So just because you're two different subspecies uh, doesn't mean that you would lose that because you're still a part of the same species. And it turns out that in some subspecies the boundaries can be somewhat arbitrary. It can be geographical um, and um, uh, variation uh, it, in terms of practice this is more rigorous and objective 
you look at some birds that um, uh, migrate to different locations, uh, natural selection and evolution will create a scenario where they look slightly different, but they're still a part of the same species. Okay. As each population will adapt to its local environment, so you see these adaptations, but the species integrity is still maintained, but these populations or these subspecies um, have uh, taken on different features due to natural selection and presumably natural selection and evolution. Now, when all the members of a species are lost, um, leaving no living descendants, and th then we say that that species is, ex is extinct. That can be uh, for a subspecies, it can be at levels higher than a species as well. Okay. When all of a species dies locally, we call that locally extinct, and when all of the local species go extinct, then we call that globally extinct. And uh, in, in looking at those species that are in danger of extinction, um, ecologists and environmental scientists are looking primarily at when losses of a population will exceed the gains. Okay? If a species is not properly adapted to its environment, say if it's introduced to a new environment and it cannot adapt to that new environment, then that's when losses will exceed gains. Uh, sometimes species are exploited uh, excessively uh, due to overhunting or hunting without regulation or harvesting and sometimes species will actually evolve into a new species and uh, this is more based on the fossil rec record and based on inferences from a fossil record um, rather than you know we don't see new species evolving in really in real time and in terms of the fossil record it appears that some species must go extinct for a new species to arise. And there are two real mass extinctions that were seen in the fossil record. Uh, one was 65 million years ago, uh, if you follow old age, uh, older theory. Uh, and this led to the dramatic uh, disappearance of the dinosaur. And again, I'm, I'm talking about this more theoretically. Uh, obviously, if you're a young Earth, theorists, then these uh, numbers are not something that you're going to buy into, but uh, our book teaches from an old earth perspective, and so, uh, you know, based on that particular record, then we're going to uh, report those numbers, but I want you to realize that these are theoretical numbers. And there was an earlier or a ma more and more massive extinction that uh, occurred in about 225 million years ago. And what this suggests is that drastic widespread environmental change leads to mass extinctions. And uh, it was thought that an asteroid hit the Earth 65 million years ago, uh, somewhere on the Yucatan Peninsula in Central America, and that's what led to the extinction of uh, dinosaurs. So why would we get concerned about extinctions? Okay. So un unfortunately, under current conditions where um, fragmentation of habitats, uh, you know, due to expansion of, of uh, uh, humans, um, it is highly improbable that the Earth's biodiversity would be able to recover from massive losses. So if we did have a cataclysmic event again, then it could be that all species would go extinct. And certain scientists uh, are very, very afraid of this. And um, species, as habitats become more fragment, um, uh, fragmented, then it would be more difficult to recover from some type of loss. And it turns out that extinction rate has increased without a, a corresponding increase in speciation. Uh, we're losing species at a rate faster than we're seeing increases in the uh, development of new species, okay. at least presumably at this point. This is a very, very difficult thing to quantify uh, because we're not necessarily keeping track of all speciation.
and after the recent ice age, this is about it's somewhere between six and ten thousand years ago, many mammalian species became extinct in a very short period of time. And uh, this has been ascribed to hunting or overhunting, hunting with regulation, regulation by some. Here are some extinct species. Uh, first is the woolly mammoth that was thought to go extinct during the Ice Age. Uh, the giant beaver and the ground sloth. And there's fossil records to show the different sizes of these animals. Um, note in the, the foreground you've got deer and the sloth is very, very large compared to the deer. Okay. So, um, if you have a massive, very sudden environmental change and the uh, amount of diversity within a particular species is not uh, large enough to sustain the species through the environmental change, meaning that the environmental conditions are just too harsh for that species to survive, then you can have extinction. Uh, by over-harvesting resources and some of the things that have gone extinct very recently, uh, have been primarily over harvested um, and harvested without some type of regulation. Um, sometimes the influx of exotic species can cause extinction. Uh, the destruction of habitat, uh, which is one of the issues that we're most concerned about with biotechnology as biotech crops uh, replace indigenous species that can lead to extinction. Uh, pollution, air, soil, and water. Uh, islandization. Uh, this isn't actually the formation of islands per se, but when the habitats become more and more isolated, then the species become much more local and the genetic diversity uh, with, within the species then suffers. Okay, uh, this is an environmental event. This is the asteroid that uh, hit the earth presumably 65 million years ago that caused the extinction of the dinosaurs. And here is the ripple effect. Uh, you can see the uh, residue that of the uh, uh, at the Yucat Yucatan Peninsula caused by this. Okay. Another thing that happens uh, that leads to extinction is deforestation. This is the rainforest in the Amazon, and as it's deforested, uh, an estimated uh, 25 species uh, go extinct for every certain amount of acres that are deforested. And then obviously pollution. Uh, pollution is a change in environmental condition and that change in environmental condition may be too harsh for some species to survive. Okay. Uh, some species are more vulnerable than others. Uh, and this is primarily due to ultimate factors, and these are genetically determined. Um, characteristics of a species' reproduction, their ecology, their anatomy, and their behavior are all pretty much genetically pre-programmed. And uh, so ultimate factors are very, very hard to overcome. If ultimate factors point towards a species' destruction, then it's likely that species will go extinct. Proximate factors are more short-term. Short uh, proximate factors can be avoided. This could include uh, pollution, exploitation, uh, change in habitat uh, when a species is displaced, or the introduction of exotic species. Exotic species are those species that don't have natural competitors, okay, that don't have natural predators, um, and exotic species can take over habitats uh, leading to loss of food source, uh, loss of um, niche in the environment, loss of habitat, and that will displace um, a native species um, due to the overgrowth of the exotic species. And by understanding ultimate factors, we can help to define which species are at risk. Those species that have a low biotic potential, um, meaning that um, they uh, do not reproduce quickly and their reproduction uh, is hampered by lack of genetic fitness. Uh, those that have a specialized habitat that is you can only find 
um, in certain locations, limited geographic range, limited ability to disperse uh, through islandization, say if their habitat is walled off or um, uh, isolated from other habitats, and uh, limited newer species that have uh, limited experience with evolutionary antagonists, things like environmental changes, um, predators, things like that. Uh, these species are going to be at risk. Okay. Uh, it turns out that many species of insects feed only on one or very few species of plants, so if one of those goes extinct, then the other one, due to ultimate factors, because of the limitations in the food source, then the insects are going to go extinct when their food sources go away. And the specialists uh, uh, that we call them. A specialist would be one that requires a special habitat or a special food source or special geographic range can be vulnerable even if their biotic potential is high, even if they reproduce at a very rapid rate and reproduce in, in, um, with lots and lots of progeny like insects, they can still be vulnerable. Um, and then in some geographic settings, organisms evolve uh, with little exposure to certain kinds of evolutionary antagonists. Um, and plants uh, can be highly susceptible to uh, large herbivores if they're introduced. Okay, And um, without this type of evolution, without this type of diversity, then um, when uh, little uh, evolution takes place, then those species can go extinct. Okay. And for animals at the higher trophic levels uh, and that require a large acreage uh, for their habitat, these are going to be associated with risk. Um, at the top of the food chain, biomagnification occurs and many substances will then accumulate in these um, these herbivores, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, carnivores. Uh, these animals are also targeted by animal control programs because if at the higher trophic levels then they can be a threat to humans. And animals with a large home range uh, are can be cut off from their habitat uh, due to um, industrialization and they're more likely to have their habitat altered. Uh, some species are highly exploited for their traits, uh, attractive uh, plumage from birds. Back when people used to wear hats a lot, they would uh, want the feathers to decorate their hats. Um, those that uh, you, you know are are hunted for their pelts, um, and those that are easy to spot, the easier they are to find, then the easier they are to hunt. Uh, and those individuals that concentrate in dense groups like large herds of buffalo, things like that, are more vulnerable to exploitation. They're much easier to hunt. Okay. And defensive behaviors, uh, especially defensive behaviors uh, against humans, can increase vulnerability because then all of a sudden the species is considered a threat to human existence. Uh, smaller populations, obviously the smaller the population becomes, the more likely it is that it goes extinct. The smaller the population becomes, the smaller the, result, the, uh, the resulting gene pool. And this leads to genetic risks. And if we look at some extinct species, I'll just give you a few of them. Uh, the dodo bird is not, it's a flightless bird. Um, that was in the Mascarene Islands in the Indian Ocean. Um, they were clubbed to death. The sailors would kill the birds so they could eat the birds' meat. And they're not <laughs> associated with higher amounts of intelligence. The dodos would run towards the sailors even though they were being clubbed. And uh, so, you know, from a genetic fitness perspective, they just weren't really smart enough to avoid extinction. Okay, I hate to say that, but um, again, uh, they were flightless, they couldn't escape, 
uh, they didn't know better to escape, and so um, they were hunted to extinction. And then other introduced what we would call exotic species uh, would include pigs, monkeys, rats, not rates, but rats and cats, um, which would prey on the eggs and chicks, and therefore the genetic fitness went down, or excuse me, the reproductive fitness went down because the survival rate of the progeny was lower. Another extinct species is the quagga. This was a zebra from South Africa, and it was overhunted um, because the settlers uh, used the meat to feed servants, and the hides were very attractive, and the hides were worth money, so they were exported. Um, the last wild quagga died in 1878, and about five years, years later, the last quagga in captivity died. Okay. Here's the uh, painting of a dodo bird. And here is an actual picture photograph of a quagga. You can see that it's a type of zebra. The stripes emanate down the neck, and the um, back of the animal is uh, has less. It has more faint stripes. Okay. The passenger pigeon. Uh, this was considered a nuisance bird, um, and they were overhunted uh, because they were considered to be uh, a, a nuisance, especially in cities, and it was may have been the most abundant bird on earth in the 19th century. Uh, the flocks never stayed in one place long enough for predators to hunt up, but because they were a nuisance, they were overhunted. Um, as industrialization started uh, um, to encroach on their habitats, then losses were seen, and by 1910 they were extinct. The heath hen, uh, this was a species that people tried to save, and it's a type of prairie chicken. Uh, you saw it in New England and mid-Atlantic states. Um, the um, hunting of these birds uh, and habitat destruction led to just a single flock that was um, isolated on Martha's Vineyard, and Martha's Vineyard is a very small island, it's a very small habitat, and you expect that the genetic fitness on a small habitat like that would suffer. Um, in order to save the population, they were bred with Midwestern prairie chickens, um, and this they were um, uh, released to bolster population, but this actually the Midwestern prairie chickens on Martha Vin Martha's vineyards were not adapted to that particular environment and probably spread genetic traits that were deleterious that made them less likely to survive and that's why it says here that they this did more harm than good by breeding the Midwestern prairie chickens with the chickens on Martha's vineyards uh, then this um, led to uh, breeding of traits that weren't appropriate for the environment, and uh, fire and predators resulted in extinction by 1933. Here's a heath hen. And here's passenger pigeons. You can see the farmers are shooting the passenger pigeons, and the sky is just dark with them. It's so dense that the sky is just completely dark. Now, extinction can occur when there's reduced genetic variation, okay? And we look at genetic drift as something that is good. We want genes to be able to cover a larger diversity in order to allow species to survive, okay? And Smaller populations are obviously going to have fewer alleles than larger populations, so they have a smaller gene pool, they have less of a chance of, to survive an environmental cataclysmic event, and once a particular allele is lost, once it's bred out, then it's gone forever. Okay, And if the population is reduced suddenly uh, through an environmental event, that creates a genetic bottleneck. Uh, the, with the bottleneck, all of the uh, alleles that are lost uh, due to the death of uh, individuals in the species, uh, that's going to lead to a substantial reduction in alleles. 
and even as the population rebounds, then those loss alleles are lost forever, and you can have a large population but not a whole lot of genetic diversity. And what results is homozygosity. You have two copies of the same gene. Heterozygosity is obviously better uh, because you have two alleles in the same species or in the same individual. Okay. Um, also, with a smaller population, there's going to be more inbreeding. Inbreeding reduces heterozygosity, and um, this reduces the species' evolutionary potential to be able to adapt to environmental changes. With less genetic diversity, there's less adaptations, natural selection uh, doesn't work, and the species is wiped out by a single environmental change. Okay. And when there's low heterozygosity, uh, that means that you have more homozygote, there's less genetic diversity, and obviously animals from heterozygous populations are going to have higher genetic fitness. There's also inbreeding depression. Uh, this is why you don't marry your cousins, because um, those traits that are deleterious then can all of a sudden become homozygous in certain progeny, and when uh, those traits are homozygous, then um, you start to lose individuals due to genetic disease that's, uh, that's associated with inbreeding. Okay, um, here's a snake and it breeds with another snake. It's got a recessive deleterious allele and in the um, progeny, if brother and sister mate, and then that deleterious allele then can lead to homozygosity and uh, this snake will have the disorder whereas outbreeding, you still have a carrier, these are still carriers of the disorder but even though they're carriers uh, if they continue to outbreed then that trait is just a heterozygous trait. Okay. Uh, one homozygous trait that you see in, uh, especially in the inbreeding of dogs. There's a lot of inbreeding because people are trying to re uh, retain the pedigree of the breed. Is hip dysplasia. Hip dysplasia is a disorder that you see in German Shepherds. You see it in a lot of different large dogs. Uh, my family used to raise Airedales and we saw hip dysplasia in Airedales. And basically it cripples the back legs. Okay, the hips then be, uh, deteriorate, becomes extremely painful to walk. And here is a um, dog that is walking assisted, okay, got a wheelchair in the back leg. Now, uh, there has been global intervention to preserve biodiversity, and the UN Convention on Biodiversity, Biological Diversity, uh, was an agreement signed in uh, 1992, and um, it called for the sustainable usage of Earth's component in order to avoid destroying habitat. Uh, fair and equitable sharing of resources. This covered genomics. And it is, it's actually, the environment's changed now that we can patent human genes. Um, this arguably, the UN Convention on Biodiversity is being um, violated because uh, patenting can lead to unfair uh, distribution of resources. Okay. And uh, this also provided facilities and financial means for technology transfer and open access to scientific and technical information. Or in other words, biodiversity through genomics uh, was directly accessible by the scientific communities in, you know, across the globe. Okay. And this uh, was, uh, treaty was signed to prevent consequences from genes as intellectual property. But again, in 2008, the uh, federal courts of the United States ruled that genes could be uh, used as intellectual property. Human genes included could be patented. Okay, the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety, this was another effort of the UN. Um, this called for the safe transfer, handling, and use of living organisms for biotechnology and regulated biotech that would have adverse effects on sustainability and biodiversity. 
and this begs the question, can biotechnology limit biodiversity? And that's a really good question. Um, and it turns out that um, the best genotypes are the ones that are planted, okay? And so the best genotypes are a single genetic variation of corn, rice, soybeans, wheat, and these are the ones that are populated or propagated, okay? These are propagated at the expense of rarer and perhaps more fragile genotypes. It's more economically viable to um, plant a robust genotype than it is a fragile genotype. And so um, these fragile genotypes can be displaced, um, but they are necessary because they may be fragile in one environment, but given an environmental change, they may be more robust. And so this has led to some backlash against GMOs and it's partially because the biotech industry has been very slow to address these concerns, concerns of environmental stakeholders in terms of the lack of biological diversity and the displacement of biological diversity by more widespread GMO crops. And the argument is that bio, uh, biodiversity will be displaced um, with this green industrial revolution where single genotype crops and, and monoculture crops are being planted throughout the world um, and it will displace less commercially valuable genotypes. Okay? And so now we have Occupy Monsanto. There are uh, multiple lawsuits against Monsanto, uh, not only for GMOs, but also for uh, pesticide residues. Okay. And there's lots of books regarding the patenting of genotypes and uh, you know corporate takeover of your food, things like that. Uh, there's the Genetic Literacy Project, um, where science trumps ideology and this is focused specifically on biodiversity and the limitations of biodiversity that this green industrial revolution is causing. Okay. And in terms of the rainforest, let's see if I can get this video to show if I'm lucky. Okay. Here are just some facts. I guess this isn't a video, but this is just uh, gives you a snippet of facts on uh, the destruction of rainforests. Okay, so that's something to check out. But in it, um, turns out that uh, the amount of Earth's rainforest has dwindled by over one half. We used to have 14% coverage. Now we're down to 6% coverage. Uh, this land is generally displaced by the timber industry that's using uh, timber for building materials. Um, and there's an estimated 137 species are lost per day. Um, this is a wag. It's just, there's no real way to track this. I have no idea, I, I have no doubt that species are being lost and displaced. But to say that 137 species are lost per day is, is just a little difficult to swallow. Okay. Uh, a lot of Western medicine is derived from rainforest con components. These are plant secondary metabolites that are used as anti-cancer therapies, analgesics, you name it, uh, antibiotics even. Um, and under 1% of the genetic resources that we have that have actually been characterized. So we don't even know what the biodiversity is. Uh, here's an example. Uh, let me go back to my slideshow. Very lush rainforest. Okay. Here's the uh, land where rainforests are being depleted. Okay. And over uh, uh, logging, over uh, timber production can leave rainforests just barren. Okay. 
and but there is an effort to repopulate rainforests. You can cause rainforests to recover uh, through sustainable agriculture and sustainable uh, timber use. Uh, biotechnology could be used to preserve biodiversity uh, by uh, preserving the genomes. So if we bank the genomes of all known species, then we have that genetic in information available. And uh, that uh, shows that, you know, perhaps we can preserve life by preserving genomes. So if a species becomes extinct, then we can at least preserve the individual alleles and we can preserve those traits via genetic engineering. We may not have the entire genome, but we can take the individual traits and we can genetically modify plants and animals to express those traits. Uh, we could perhaps uh, preserve an entire species through uh, cloning, by cloning into a very similar species through enucleation and nuclear transfer. Uh, this is how, uh, when they talked about cloning a Neanderthal baby, this is how they uh, um, proposed that uh, that particular baby would be cloned, is to enucleate a human egg and then do nuclear transfer of the Neanderthal genome, genome directly through cloning. Okay. Uh, there is a global genome initiative by the Smithsonian Institute. It's been funded by the United States right now. Okay. And this is to collect and barcode uh, the genomic diversity uh, along the major branches of the tree of life. The tree of life is just a, it's just a, basically a phylogenetic tree. And the goal is to cryopreserve about 50% of the diversity of life in the next five years. So cryopreservation means that a portion of this that's cryopreserved could be regenerated. In fact, the goal is that everything that's cryopreserved could be regenerated. Um, uh, however, some species don't uh, uh, cryopreserve as well as others. Obviously, mammalian species are not going to survive cryopreservation. Okay. And then increase computational genomics. Uh, and that way, we have diversity of the species. Uh, through at least the individual genetics. We know the gene sequences that are associated with that allele and we can preserve the genetic information that way. And then train the next generation of genomic researchers in order to discuss and preserve biodiversity. So as commercial interests start to encroach on biodiversity, there can be some level of pushback by the scientific community. Okay. And this is the Global Genomic uh, Initiative's logo. Okay, and here are some of the large cryopreservation tanks that they use in order to preserve these different species. And genomic characterization is being done on rare species. Uh, here's the Star uh, of Linny. Uh, of the, um, uh, the Global Genomics Institute study. This is a sea slug that was uh, discovered by California Academy of Sciences expedition. Okay, and just some parting thoughts regarding stewardship. You know, we are uh, stewards of the earth. We're stewards of the species of the earth. And so some type of balance must be maintained between providing for the growing population of humans as well as preserving diversity, okay? And there is a sustainable ecosystem approach. This is sort of a happy middle approach um, rather than just a utilitarian approach where we're doing everything that we can do to preserve the human species without uh, regard to ecosystems or uh, a pure conservationist approach, this is sort of the happy medium, okay? And consequences of biotechnology need to be honestly assessed, things like gene drift, transgenes making it into other crops and limiting genetic diversity. This needs to be done prior to commercial application. And above all, and this is why you know, I drill into you that you guys are the science experts, you're the thought experts in this area, Good science should always prevail over politics, and so good science must be completed 
good science needs to be completed devoid of conflict of interest or recognizing and um, facing head-on conflicts of interest and this should always prevail over politics. Okay. And so we have the example in the Genesis account and God saw everything that he made and he beheld that it was very good. Okay. And I believe that biblical stewardship grows out of the love of God. Okay. And so if you love God, you keep his commands and you steward his creation. Okay. And we are commanded to dress and keep God's creation. Okay. And dressing and keeping God's creation actually appears to trump material wealth. Okay, we're not supposed to worry about our material possessions. Uh, and we're lying, laying up treasures in heavens and not treasures in earth. And that's not to say that money is bad. Money is not bad. I like acquiring wealth because I like paying my bills. Um, but acquisition of material wealth, I do not think would trump our rules as environmental stewards. Okay. And that concludes this video presentation. Uh, I will get this posted as soon as possible.